G'day everyone, I'm Wayne Dowson from Wayne Dowson Fine Art and this is a portrait of 21 year old Tom Pico. Tom is now 97 and I am very excited to announce he will be part of our Anzac Portrait series. This is part one of Tom's interview and I look forward to sharing part two and the Anzac Portrait with you all soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tom Pico. Right, more on me. Uh, the uh, 23rd of uh, uh, 1916. Uh, don't ask me what hour, I wouldn't have a clue. And uh, my mother was me, born grey. She was born in McLean on the Clarence River. My mother went to school at Almara from uh, South Cape, which is quite a considerable walk, but of course, a country one. Was coming home from school and I was uh, uh, sort of speared by the blacks and the uh, shoulder. A, a boy, actually, a boy in original. Dad's uh, name was William, uh, William John uh, Pico, which is a French name, and he was French or was born in France, but had come out here at a very early age. And uh, I'm giving you a bit of a rundown here. He married, he met my mother in the surf at Bondi and she was drowning. So he pulled her out and as a result he was punished by marrying her. <laughs> After two years, she begged her dad into moving back to the Clarence River. So we went back to the Clarence River and uh, dairy farm, Southgate. Southgate in those days was on the outer, very outer perimeter of Grafton and uh, uh, we had it was a wonderful place to grow up in. Uh, my sister didn't appreciate as much as I. She was never a, a really country girl, which is an amazing thing. But she was very brilliant. She was a brilliant scholar and uh, brilliant in many ways. So that compensated for her uh, lack of liking the Clarence River the way I did. But I had a cousin there who had been orphaned, uh, Emma, and she and I became firm mates. And, she had a thing about kangaroo, kangaroos. She always had a kangaroo in the house as a pet. Anyway, my early years on the, uh, on the Clarence River, uh, I loved the place, I still do. It's a lovely spot on earth, actually. And uh, I've got fond memories of it. By the time I was about eight or nine, I don't ever remember learning to ride a horse. I could always ride a horse. Uh, I had a creepy pony. And that was a snake, of course, naturally creamy. And it was about two big handles across the back of my legs used to be splayed out and across it, but that was my start of my riding. But when I was about eight or nine, my grandfather, he'd pick up mobs up in Boyder and places like that, and we'd run about to South Grafton. South Grafton at that time had a, uh, a stockyard, a big stockyard, which they still have to this day. But they also had a, uh, 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 a plant, a meat plant there. So the cattle would either go to the meat plant for killing or they'd go to the side yard for... Uh, but I used to enjoy that. And uh, on my 10th anniversary, going from there up to Nimboida and places up on the top of the river, picking up mobs and bringing them back to South Grafton, uh, my granddad gave me a, a knife complete with the, uh, the pouch and I proudly wore that for a great many years. By rather recollections there I became a very good shot. Uh, always had a pea rifle in those days. I don't remember learning to shoot a rifle because I just couldn't. I used to find double barrel shotguns at great peril to my shoulders and my help. Uh, but uh, getting back to the uh, pea rifles, every Saturday Arvo I cringe now when I think about this, but we used to go down, there were billions, literally, of uh, rosellas and parrots floating around the place in those days. That was before the cats and the foxes, and, and uh, we used to go down, we would shoot them. We would shoot them for pie. My grandmother and my mother would make pies out of them, and uh, they were incidentally extremely good eating, I might add. But the thing was, if you shot them through the body, it was a wasted child, wasted bird. You had to shoot them through the end of the neck. 
So I became rather a good shot, which was became handy to me at a later stage of my life. But uh, so we, I've had you know fond memories of that. And, uh, we had billabongs there. And I used to love going down to billabongs, and we'd get the big ducks down there, a million ducks. I you know we'd go down and get the duck eggs, chase. Dodge, dodging snakes, there were millions of them around at that time, not millions, but literally hundreds of them around. So it was rather a perilous way to get duck eggs, which my grandmother loved, and they used to get them for her and mum. The cemetery was on the way out to uh, uh, Southgate, and uh, at that time there were a lot of Indians up that way, and much like another, and they used to have the uh, the, the wagons, horse-drawn wagons with the old sort, you can buy uh, silks, satins, kettles, pans, frying pans, uh, saddles, spurs, stirrups, everything. They sold the flame and money for these things and uh, we used to love them to come around. You could hear them coming with that big bills rattling with <laughs> kids in front of manly. They'd throw us lollies and all that sort of stuff. And uh, of course, the ladies of the house would be out, no matter they have a look at them, if they saw something, oh, they might see a pair of spurs or something like that, they would, they'd just buy them and go. Granddad would say, You can't afford that, don't buy that. Little grandma, by, by the way, my grandfather, Tom Gray, was six feet, 14 stone, about this wide across the shoulder and thick through the chest, and a very, very tough. Gentlemen, indeed. The uh, grandma had come from Cork in Ireland and she was exactly five feet high. So it was this and this, which if I can give you one guess, who was the royal boss in the family? <laughs> Granddad thought he was, but he wasn't. <laughs> when I was about 11, I would say. My mother took very ill and at the same time my grandmother took ill. So there was really no one to look after Thea, Thea and I and them and my cousin, my orphan cousin who was a, my mate. And uh, so they asked my uncle and auntie at Tullawatcha Creek, wonderful place, and you're probably wondering where the flame of hell is that ever? <laughs> well I'll tell you, it's out from Glen Ray. And if you're wondering where Glen Ray is, Glen Ray is between Grafton and Coffs Harbour. When they volunteered to take me in, I was there 12 months, 12 of the happiest 12 months I've ever spent. Uh, we had a bit of a... So I said, look, why don't I sleep in the kitchen? Which was nice and warm anyway in winter, hot in summer in winter. Uh, so I had a swag and I used to sleep in the, in the ground out there. Every morning at 3 o'clock, you'd get woken with a hot mug of tea and a slice of toast about an inch thick and a slab of butter right across it about half an inch thick, which I loved and just to this day. And uh, that was uh, not your breakfast. That was so you could go out for the milking. Then we'd go out and start the milking. We would finish the milking about half past five, half past six. One day towards the weekend, it was what have been a Thursday or Friday, and uh, my mother had come out of the hospital and she was coming down to uh, stay with Uncle uh, Auntie Grace and Uncle Bill. And we'd gone into Glen Ray to pick her up on the train. And on the way back from the train, we could see all the smoke. And we got out there, it was the house on fire, burnt to, burnt to the ground. Uh, so that was the end of the idyllic 12 months. Uh, tragic. You would then move to Sydney, so you were about, what, yeah. 12 or 13? About 12, I was, well, I was 12. Mm. Yeah, my mother and father thought it was time that the third of mine, my sister was a brilliant girl, you know, she shot up school up the way out. And uh, they thought they'd give it, it's about time that they gave both of us a go by giving us a decent education. We moved out from Clarence and uh, we settled in Coogee and we lived in Waltham Street which was only a matter of a few hundred yards away from the water. So I used to go down swimming of an afternoon and I would say, 
you're going to be home by five o'clock, quarter past at the very, very latest. And her word was to be obeyed. <laughs> we were down there this hour, we used to swim on the reef, the south end of the beach, uh, the uh, surf club is. It's a good reef there, and it, you'd always get some kind of way, even if it was only two inches away, but you got one anyway. Uh, there's a fair wave this harbour. Um, I'd been in, it was near time for me to go home, so I came out and I was telling myself off. While I was telling myself off uh, on the beach there, there was this piercing scream from the reef. Well, I turned around, there's Jack throwing up his arms, and there's all the blood in the world floating around the place and uh, you could see this shark swimming around was coming in for another attack at the time. And I've always had the greatest possible admiration for the two lifesavers whose names I do not know and I don't think they even got a medal for this, but they went in without hesitation and took him away from the shark and brought the shark, didn't attack them, why I don't know. But anyway, they got him in with the shark trailing them for quite a way on the way in. And a couple of other blokes went out and started kicking up water and all that sort of thing. And it was just, there has no effect on them, of course. But anyway, we got, they got him in on the beach and we laid him out in the sand. He was a little messy. It was obvious he was going to lose his leg if he survived. Anyway, Jack did survive. Jack Dagworthy was his name. Anyway, Jack survived, but he's a funny man. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> He was older than us, but he used to go to all our dances up at some bridges at Coochie, the, the church dance or where. And uh, Jack, when he was up there, he used to dance. By this time he had a ten leg. Every 40 minutes or so he used to go into the, the, the hall up the forward end of the building uh, where you left your hats and coats and that sort of thing. He'd go in and get his oil can out of his pocket and he'd pull his trouser leg up and he used to oil his leg. <laughs> then go out and brush a bit of oil off the, the loose stuff, then go back out and dance again. The time I came to leave college and I passed the leaving to Jenny and all that sort of thing. And I was going to be a doctor. And I can honestly say I think I would have been a good one. But uh, Dad's business blew up. The uh, banks foreclosed on him, and, uh, which they did with great gusto in those days. Uh, they haven't lost their touch, they still do. And, so uh, this is, you're talking about the depression now? Yeah, the depression the years? Depression. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I went up the country, of course, I jumped, jumped the rattler, as they used to say, and I was like, anyway, I got up, I went up, back up to my trend, and I had three, and uh, I got a job in a farm up there, and I was working on that. I had a bunch of blokes, it's a bunch of family, little family thing, you know, and uh, I've been up there a while, I forget how long now, it would have been six and eight months or something like that. And I, uh, we got a message from the police station to uh, ring up my father, and, uh, and he said, get yourself down here right away, I've got a job for you. I said, what sort of a job, Dad? He said, don't worry about what sort of a job it is, mate, he said. Get yourself down here, it'll be a good one. My job at the, uh, under my two German masters at the Claude Neon was the art of glass blowing, which is in Germany is a profession. And uh, these two chaps were top liners at, the, at their job. Uh, we did uh, all the glass instruments for all the laboratories around Australia. Remy Depter, the German, he was a dedicated Nazi and uh, he loved Hitler, worshipped Hitler and one day or another. So he, for obvious reasons he wasn't popular anywhere in the factory. But he was most unpopular with me because he started on me one French name of uh, all that sort of thing. So one thing led to another. So one morning we were up on the top deck and uh, he gave a bit of a push so I pushed him back. And uh, he's a man who's a couple of stone heavier than me so he pushed me and I went over on the wooden floor. So when I got up, I punched him. <laughs> and uh, it was on for young and old after that. And, uh, we, we really got into it. Within minutes, 
the whole factory had stopped and they were pouring out from downstairs, upstairs. My mother gave me a couple of stone in weight. I'd learnt the box of Titty Ryan. Titty Ryan was an old uh, middleweight champion of Australasia, that's Australia and New Zealand. He was an old bare knuckle fighter. And uh, his idea of teaching to fight was if it hurt, he'd say, Well, I didn't feel it, so you're all right, we'll keep going. <laughs> he was tough and he was hard and he taught me to fight. And I learned to take blows without flinching, without referring how hurt I was, I might be hurt. So, Anyway, this stood me in good stead in this fight with the German Deptak. Uh, in the finish, we knocked each other down. I put him down after about half an hour to the applause of all our mob, because they were all on my side and that thing. And uh, he, he, got, he got halfway up and he slumped down again. And he did, I thought he was going to get right up. And, he, and then all of a sudden he just went down like a bag of flour, won't use the other term, and uh, it was all over and I'd won the fight.